Well, my name is Forrest Townsley. I was born at a little place called Jonah, right out of Georgetown, Texas, on August 8, 1924. Born at home. The doctor never did file a birth certificate or anything. <laughs> Relatively about two years old, we moved out close to Lubbock, Texas, on a cotton farm. So when I was four or five years old, I worked on the cotton farm, chopping cotton, in the fall, picking cotton. And uh, then in 1929, the Depression really didn't change us when they had the Great Fall, because uh, we had the same thing. We raised our own crops, we raised our own food. So basically that was the way we lived until 1935. We uh, had to leave the farm and we moved back to Austin. Then. In 1938, I quit school and took a job with a bottling company called Royal Crown Bottling. I was paid uh, six cents an hour, working 60 hours a week for $10. But <clears throat> at that time, I could walk three or four blocks, get a real good Chinese lunch for 15 cents or I could go to the hamburger stand for a nickel, get a good hamburger. So in 1941, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, my cousin, who lived a little ways from me, came that afternoon and wanted me to go with him and join the Navy. But my mother at that time would not sign and July the 4th of 1942, me and a couple of buddies were driving around and we heard on the radio that they were going to open the Navy recruiting office on July the 4th for the patriotic people who might want to join. So my mother signed and we joined on July the 4th, 1942. We were sent to Houston on the 5th and was examined, tested, put on a train and told not to open the blinds so nobody would know where we were going. Uh, well, there, were, there were three training stations, San Diego, California, Great Lakes, Illinois, and Norfolk, Virginia. So we went to San Diego for boot camp. After boot camp, I went to a gunnery school, which was located in Michigan City, Indiana, right on the tip end of Lake Michigan. After that, I was sent to Norfolk, Virginia, and assigned to the amphibious force. Put on an LST, and we went to New York City for dual purpose, a shakedown cruise, and to be loaded up. Got to New York City, we had a guy from Brooklyn that was on the ship. We went ashore together, and he told me, he said, now whatever you do, don't be staring at the Empire State Building or them other big buildings. I said, well, I probably will, because being from Texas, I've never seen anything like this. Anyway, we went to New York, loaded up. The true meaning of LST is landing ship tanks. It was the biggest one in the amphibious. 
Jokingly, the Navy personnel called it a large, slow target because the top speed was very slow. They were all flat bottom. And of course, being flat bottom, they were rough on the open ocean. So we left New York City thinking we were going to North Africa because they were going to invade North Africa. But we went south and southwest and we knew we were going through the Panama Canal over in the South Pacific. Before the service, I had, uh, I had seen the Gulf of Mexico, but I had absolutely no idea how much water was out there. When we got through the Panama Canal, started in that open water, at one time it was 23 days without seeing land. And I thought, where did all this water come from? <laughs> On the LST, we had to go up a ladder, through the child line, and back down. The only time I come close to getting hurt was when I went up, got my child, and was going down back to the crawl quarters where the tables were. Uh, the, somehow or another, a Jap plane had got in, dropped a bomb close enough that it shook the ship, and I fell down the stairs. And the worst thing was the hot coffee all over me, but I didn't get hurt. But uh, that was a close call. I could have broke my back on them steel steps. But we had good food, always had good coffee. Uh, we never run out of coffee, never run out of food. The PT boats that were down there, which John Kennedy was a captain of a little PT boat. And I'm sure that we probably supplied him with food because they'd have no way to store very much. And we were cruising in the South Pacific uh, one day, and all of a sudden, a Japanese submarine came out of the water. They run and uncovered their gun because they did not know that we had a sub-chaser with us as an escort. Of course, as soon as they saw the sub-chaser, they covered the gun, run, and went under. But it was too late. The sub-chasers started throwing what they call depth charges. They go so deep and they blow up. After four or five depth charges, all kinds of debris began to come up. No men, but debris. So we knew he had sunk the submarine. That was our first experience with activity. Then we went on to uh, Solomon Islands, which is basically the only one that was secure was Guadalcanal. The morning we got to Guadalcanal, 120 Japanese bombers, strafers came in on us. And they, out of the 120, the army and the ships shot down 97 out of 120. But that was our second experience. Then we loaded up and began our so-called island hopping. Each island was occupied by the Japanese. So we would load up. Usually on the top side of the LST was all kinds of supplies. Then underneath was usually tanks or uh, heavy equipment for guns. And we, we pulled into the beach and uh, opened our doors and let the ramp down. The first to go would be the first Marines uh, in uh, tanks and uh, heavy guns, mostly at that time the 90 millimeter. They would go in. Once they secured a place, then we would lower the equipment and run it ashore. And sometimes we would wait a day or two because we carried doctors on our ship. They would uh, 
take the wounded on, take care of the wounded, and we would take them back to a hospital on Guadalcanal. Now, this happened many times. Then one day, as we were fixing to land on another island called Vela La Vela, the captain came to me because I was a 40 millimeter specialist. He said, I have an army 40. I want you to set it up on the fantail, which is the very back of the ship. And he said, uh, we'll have to give you some men to train because this is gonna be a tough one. That was his explanation. The 40 millimeter was a new gun that came out in about 42 and it would fire 120 rounds a minute. We had a pointer, which was me. I fired the gun. The other side of the gun was what they call a trainer. He would move the gun right and left. And the most important person was the first loader. The clips came four to a clip. Now the way the clips had to be handled was had to be perfect. If you drop them in straight, they'll jam. So you had to drop them in at the angle that they were because the shell itself was much bigger than the projectile. So you had to be right. The only person they could give me for that was a black boy from New York City. Never been on a gun, never been topside while we were under attack. And I explained to him very carefully, don't look at the planes, look at what you're doing. That was the best loader I ever had the whole time I was in the Navy. I blew the barrel out of the gun, wore it out because you're not supposed to fire that many without less off on it. So we hit Bella La Bella, and uh, we had several high altitude bombing raids from the Japanese. And then about two o'clock, 27 Zeros and dive bombers were coming in. They go to the sun, get in the sun, and then come down at you. So you have to look at the sun in order to shoot. I started shooting before they got into the sun because the captain said, you will not have any communication. You're a gunner's mate. You've fired the gun for months. You know when you can hit, when you can shoot. So I started shooting and uh, as they came in, but when it was over, the captain called down with a foghorn and told me to go to the bow of the ship where I had been all this time and flood the ammo room because we had a fire going and he was afraid it would blow the ammunition room up. So I couldn't understand it because we had a man up there with a key to the box to unlock it to flood it. But I didn't ask, so I went. When I got to the box to unlock it, to flood it. The bow was a mess. There were dead people everywhere. One good friend of mine was hanging in the harness of a 20 millimeter with his head cut off, about half right above his eyes. It was sickening. And uh, then I run back to the back of the ship where I was, because we didn't know if there was any more raids coming. Fortunately, there weren't. When we were hit, I had no idea because uh, it was not a direct hit. Where our bow was, was close to some tall coconut palms. Apparently, a 500 or a 1,000 pound bomb hit the coconut palm, blew up. So all of our men were killed by shrapnel. That shrapnel was so powerful that it went through one inch solid steel. The gun tub 
was just ripped to pieces. Our uh, place where we used the cable to lower and raise the elevator had shrapnel go through both sides of it. The man that was firing the 20s head was cut off by shrapnel. So we had 370 something rips and tires and holes in the bow of the ship. But the commander who was in the harbor called my captain and said, who was firing that 40 millimeter first? And the captain said, well, that was gunner's mate Townsley. He did not have a phone. We are no way to know. And I told him to shoot when he could hit. Commander out in the bay said, I think you ought to get rid of all the phones because he shot down four or five planes before anybody else fired a shot. Of course, I didn't know that. When you're firing, you don't know who else is firing. It's noisy and uh, you, you're concentrating on what you're doing. Now, the man that was on a gun above me was a 350 anti-aircraft gun because he had telebinocular lenses. He said, your second tracer went right through the cockpit of one of those Jap planes. He told me that. But then the uh, commander sent me a letter. I wished he'd have sent it to Washington, but he just sent it as a personal thing because he gave me credit for shooting down seven out of the 27 planes. The LST is 354 feet long. I moved from right on the bow to right on the stern. So I moved probably 350 feet. And the only time we got hit was that time when I was moved. I told the captain, said, well, that's odd. I said, no, it ain't. I said, my mother's home praying. <laughs> And she was. So we pulled off, went uh, back to Guadalcanal. On the way, we had to sew the men who lost their lives in the canvas bags, put weights in there, cover them with a flag on a board, and as the captain read from the Bible, we would lift it up and drop the bag, the canvas bag into the water. The most heart-rendering thing I think I saw in the whole time in the Navy. It was stressful. The most stressful time was burying the shipmates in the water, especially the one that took my place. I don't know, I felt uh, he was a little Italian boy and uh, he was maybe a little older than me, but he was smaller. He was real small. And uh, I don't know, I just felt obligated or something to him because he was sitting right where I had sat for 14 months and then sat again for another seven or eight months. I, I was mad a lot at the Japanese because I figured this way, I was in the prime of life, just about to turn 18, and from 18 to through 21, I lost. Well, I didn't lose them, but what I mean is I was tied down to something that wasn't what I had planned. Other than that, I had one Japanese boy that we captured and we had him on the ship. He wasn't 17, but he was a pilot at 17. And he could talk good English because he and his parents lived in San Francisco. And his parents were given orders to send him back to Japan. He was 14. And they made him because they were Japanese citizens, were not American citizens, and he was Japanese born. So he went back to Japan and was put in the Air Force. He was flying a torpedo plane at 17. And he 
crashed. And we picked him up, and uh, he told me, he said, I have never dropped a torpedo that hit an American ship. He said, I love America. I didn't want to fight them. And he said, I'm tickled to death to be captured. That was his, his statement. At 17, probably 75% of them during the war did not want to fight. It was a uh, Hirohito that stirred up the Japanese. And I think that most of the Japanese I did not want to fight. Then we left again, went to Pearl Harbor, and uh, went to Okinawa. On Okinawa, we were there two weeks before the invasion, and we were firing rockets on islands on Okinawa and the little neighbor islands. We fired thousands of rockets, and uh, then on the Easter Sunday, 1945, the invasion crew came. And being a little country boy from Texas, I never seen so many ships in my life. There was 1,500 ships in the invasion force. Battle wagons, aircraft carriers, destroyers, liberty ships, landing ships, everything imaginable and they landed on Okinawa. Then we became uh, what they call uh, picket duty. 80 miles off the coast of Japan, two of us would go up and go back and forth because we had a good radar system. That radar system would pick up the planes, mostly kamikazes. When they left Japan, we'd pick them up and radio back to Okinawa that they were coming. One day, we was, two of us was on and two of us in harbor. We were in harbor, but we were loading rockets, and we were supposed to remove a ship from his picket duty and take his place at 6 o'clock one day. We couldn't. We were loading rockets. So the uh, commander said, well, you go up tomorrow. They'll stay tonight and go tomorrow and relieve them. That night, the ship we were supposed to relieve was hit by a kamikaze. There's 54 men on a LSMR. Four of them were blown into the water and lived. 50 of them lost their lives. We were supposed to be there. In case you're wondering about the kamikaze, it is a Japanese pilot who was put in a plane with a bomb and no way of escape. The wheels that he uses to take off with stay on the ground, and he's dead. They have his funeral before he leaves. So it's a suicide mission. Most of them were blown up before they landed, hit a ship. We did lose quite a few in uh, that one 24-hour period where so many of them came in we did lose in a couple of aircraft carriers and uh, uh, probably as much as 20 ships. And that was the last big push, no more. But that one day, that one 24 hour, Japan spent everything they could to knock the American troops out. But we were sent back to Pearl Harbor and then the atomic bomb ended the war. So I was in Honolulu when the war ended. 
Seattle let loose all the pent-up emotions of three years and eight months of war. And to the victors, the spoils. The pose may not be dignified, but the young lady is not the least upset. Peace, it's wonderful. I think every gun in Pearl Harbor let go, and it was quite a celebration because that's where the war started, and they, when it ended, they were all, oh, it's unbelievable. And we were too, of course. We thought, oh boy, now we don't have to go back to Okinawa. It's over. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. I was very glad to serve the United States. I was proud of the United States, still proud of the United States, proud of the American way. And I feel if I was a youngster, I would be prepared to defend America regardless of what it took. I was willing to give my life. I was willing to do anything necessary to keep America free.